it's wrong. No, the mic. Oh, no. Okay, okay. it's back. Right. Shall we? It's, we're about five minutes early, um, but seeing as the room is pretty full. Um, pretty full, you mean? <laughs> I don't think, I was going to ask if there was any, are, there, are there any rows where there are any seats free at all? It looks, no empty seats at all, are there? Okay. Wow, right. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, this is a two-part session. Um, so we'll go for 50 minutes, and then we'll have a 10-minute break, so you can all get up and then come back and fight for the seats again. Um, or go to another talk if you want, of course. We hope that you don't. Um, but So we'll, we'll run for 50 minutes, try and have a 10-minute break at the usual roughly 10-minute break time, um, and then go for another uh, 50, up, taking us up to, uh, up to lunchtime. Um, right, uh, my name's Andy Wilkinson. I work for Pivotal, um, where I'm uh, primarily spend my time working on Spring Boot. And I'm Stefan, working also on Spring Boot, uh, Spring Framework, and I also take care of a tool called Startup Spring.io, if you've heard of that. Uh, right, so this is uh, a fairly low level talk um, about Spring Boot. We're really going to get kind of down into the depths, right down into the nitty gritty, um, and hopefully. Our goal is for you to leave this talk really understanding what's going on in Spring Boot. Um, people sometimes say, is Spring Boot magic? Um, is there too much magic? There was a thread on Reddit, my favorite place on the internet. Um, no, it's not. I think yesterday, um, where people were saying, you know, is it too much magic? Um, hopefully, this talk will dispel. Uh, we don't think it's too much magic. Uh, once you understand what's going on, we think it all makes sense. So hopefully you will agree with us come the end. Before we start, how many of you uh, in the room are not using Spring Boot today? A handful. OK. Um, we'll do your best. We'll do our best to bring you along with us. Um, if you have questions, if anyone has questions as we're going through, please just stick your hand up and ask as we're going. Don't save them till the end. Um, there's no such thing as a stupid question, it's just that we've done a poor job of explaining something. So please stick your hand up and ask, um, and then hopefully we can get a microphone or we can repeat the question so everyone, everyone can hear. Um, right, well without further ado, uh, the talk is kind of a mixture of explanations and uh, live coding, demonstrating stuff as we go along. So let's get started um, with a little bit of coding. Right, uh, so you should mention at this point it's not my laptop, right? Oh, yes. So Thank you. Stefan has a hipster brand new MacBook Pro, which does not agree with this projector. Um, so he is used to a French keyboard. So he's using a UK keyboard, an unusual laptop. So cross your fingers for him. I have the Belgian layout on it, so I, I just don't, I need not to see the keys <laughs> and I'll be fine. Um, right. So for the purpose of the, the first part, um, we are going to go deep into auto configuration and how you can create your own. And for the purpose of the for the purpose of this demo, uh, we are going to work with a service that's extremely complicated, as you can see. So I have an hello service with a single method that just says hello. Very very uh, complex, and I have an implementation of that service that use a configurable prefix and suffix. So hello and um, exclamation mark, respectively. And just around the, the name parameter with that. So hello, space, prefix, suffix. Uh, and I want we want to show you uh, how you can basically use Spring Boot and the auto configuration with that. So again, we want to focus on infrastructure here. We want to focus on what Spring Boot can do for you. So we don't want to focus on complexity. Um, of the service itself, of the library itself. So let's say you're, you are the, the maintainer of this LO service library. It's much more complex in practice. You know, um, there are many ways to configure uh, your library because there's many uh, different options, etc. But you as a maintainer, or as you, you as a user, a power user of that library, you know what the default use case can be, and you want basically to expose them. So that's what we have. We have a single library with those those two classes, and we have an app. And this app is actually completely empty now. The only thing it has is a dependency on the library. So we'll work on that now. OK. So let's just recap um, what Stefan showed you. So this is a boilerplate um, kind of minimal Spring Boot application. 
main method and the Spring Boot application annotation. Um, and the thing here that really makes this a Spring Boot application is all triggered by the presence of that Spring Boot application annotation on, uh, on the main class. So let's dig into a bit now. What does Spring Boot application actually do? What's going on there? Well, it's actually a combination of three different annotations. A Spring, a Spring Boot configuration, which is basically like Spring Framework's configuration annotation, which I imagine you're all uh, familiar with. Component scan, which um, I suspect you've all already seen before, and enable auto configuration. So, enable co auto configuration is the thing that switches on all Spring Boot's auto configuration. That's the thing that enables um, the kind of the convention over configuration approach that Spring Boot adopts. First of all, let's dig into what component scan is doing in a typical app. Because it's really important to how the application context gets populated with all of the beans. Um, and Spring Boot kind of layers some extra stuff on top of component scanning, which is kind of important to understand the ordering all of, of all of this so you know what's happening when your Spring Boot app is, is starting up. So the component scan annotation, um, as you may well already know, um, is associated with a particular package. So here we've got com.example.hello. So that's where, uh, that's the package in which a class that was annotated with component scan was found. And that is key to all of the components that the, the scanning will find. It will only find components in that class and uh, in that package and any packages that are nested beneath it. So in this example, we'll find classes in com example hello alpha and com example hello bravo, but anything um, that isn't in com example hello or a, a sub package won't be found. So it lets you scope down the amount of the class path that will be scanned. Um, a mistake that we sometimes see is that someone will write a Spring Boot application and they'll stick their main class in the default package. And that then basically says to component scanning, you need to scan every single class on the class path. So it's everything in Java Lang, it's everything in the JRE, everything in all of the third party libraries that you're depending upon. And inevitably things get found that shouldn't have been found and also startup can be quite slow because far more is scanned um, than should have been. So one gotcha. Make sure that you don't put your main application class in the default package. Always put it in a package that um, you know, matches uh, your company or the particular application that you're writing. And also, if something isn't being picked up, as in this case with com example Charlie, you want to make sure that um, components that you expect to be found are in the same package as the component scanner in a sub package. So in this case, we just need to move com example Charlie over underneath, underneath the com example hello package. So when you build an app, basically, choose a package for that app and make it unique. So make it so that it's not shared with something else. And structure your code that way. Of course, you don't have to do that. That's what we recommend. But if you do it, you'll get plenty of additional um, goodies that works out of the box. So we have our package. Um, and the component scanning finds everything that is annotated with component. But there are a bunch of other annota uh, annotations which are in themselves components. So these are other annotations that are meta annotated um, with components. So by meta annotation, I mean an annotation that has an annotation on it. So if you look at the source for, for example, configuration, the declaration of the configuration annotation is itself annotated with components. So it is a component. It's a specialization of components. Um, and we have others. Uh, so there's repository, um, there's controller, REST controller, for if you're doing um, uh, web stuff. There's a service, if the type that you're representing is a particular service. Uh, some of them have special semantics. Uh, so a repository, for example, switches on um, certain persistence exception translation that the framework will do. I think service doesn't have any special meaning. It's no. just there um, to help you um, and your future self and your colleagues that think this thing is supposed to be a service. The annotation is giving you an indication that it's a service rather than just any old sort of component. And you're free to create others. If you have um, other annotations that you want to create, you can annotate them with components and specialize things a bit um, if that makes sense for the domain that your, um, your application exists in. So all of these components that are found by component scanning, because they're in packages um, that were uh, the same or nested beneath where the component scan annotation was found, um, are turned into beans. So let's have a look at uh, 
how that works in action. So um, let's let's create something that's actually going to use our service. So for that, I'm I'm going to see all the code is created by you now. Um, I'm going to implement a command line runner, which is a callback interface in Spring Boot that allows you to run some code on startup, just for the sake of the demo. And I'm going to inject uh, my hello service. Uh, there's no such hello service at the moment. And just call it right with um, something like, say hello world. There's a neat thing here, actually, um, that some of you may have not have noticed uh, in Spring Framework 4.3, I think. Yes. Um, so there's no, you're probably familiar with the auto-wired annotation to indicate that you want type, uh, parameters to be injected into a constructor. In Spring Framework 4.3, you don't need it anymore if the class has a single constructor that can be used. So if there's a single constructor in the class, then the framework will use that one without needing you to sprinkle auto-wired all over your constructors. So a nice way to remove a bit of Spring-specific code um, from your application and will save you, save you a line in your source as well. So basically, if I run this app I just did, um, nothing happens and nothing happens basically because that class has no reason to be picked up, right? It's not flagged as a component that the, the, the application context should take care of. But if I add component, uh, like we basically explained, and I run the app again, then it will be taken into account and obviously it will fail uh, because I'm actually asking now the context to give me a bin of type hello service and there's no such bin. And you notice, you'll notice if you don't know that already, we'll talk about that in more details later. You get this nice uh, error report telling you exactly what's, what is going on. So one of the action was uh, consider defining a bin of type hello service in your configuration. So that's what we are going to do. Our Spring Boot app is a configuration, so configuration, component scan, and enabling auto configuration. So do you want to show them, um, go into the source for Spring Boot application and just show the mesh the thing? Yes, good call. So there you can see that I was talking about is the annotation has um, the other annotations on it. So component scans there, enable auto configuration and, and Spring Boot configuration. So that's, that's what I meant by meta annotating. So let's create a bean. Uh, type hello service, so that's very basic. And we want to create some kind of custom prefix there. And if I run that, no surprise, that's actually to show me my message there, right? Easy. So now, um, there's really nothing magic, magic about this. So if you, if you basically remove the annotation altogether, basically you'll get an empty class with no component scan, no auto configuration, nothing. So you can see now the component scan is there, so we won't find your component. Um, we won't define that as a bean. Uh, we won't do anything. We'll just start an empty class, basically. You could also replace that if you wish to. Um, well, there's probably no reason to do it, but you can do so. Uh, so you can do component scan and configuration. And that's going to start an app uh, where the auto configuration doesn't kick in. So we, we won't process the auto configuration. So each of those pieces are separated, and we bring them into a single annotation of just for a convenience reason. So we, um, the reason we have the Spring Boot application annotation is we, um, we believe, and from what we've seen, 99% of Spring Boot apps use auto configuration. Um, and that's what we want you to do. Mm -hmm. Um, but you can turn it off. You don't have to use it. If you want to configure your app manually, as you would in a traditional Spring Framework application, you absolutely can do so and still take advantage of a great many of the other features that Spring Boot offers. So you can switch auto configuration off and still package an executable jar file with an embedded server container in it. You just have to declare the, uh, say you wanted to use Tomcat, for example, you just have to declare the bean that initializes Tomcat and sets everything up. But you can still use embedded containers, um, configuration yeah. properties, uh, executable jars, all of that stuff, without auto configuration um, if you wish. But we would rather, if you find a problem with auto configuration and you're thinking of going down this route, please open an issue and let us know why you want to do that. Because we'd rather fix the problem or help to guide you and keep you using auto configuration because we think the benefits are really worth it rather than you um, moving on and doing something different um, because 
hopefully, uh, if we can keep you on the path of auto configuration, you'll actually, in terms of productivity, you'll, you'll be, things will be much better. All right, so let's just recap again what Stefan went through there. So we had a Spring Boot application that published a bean um, and a component that was declared that, um, that consumed that bean. So we've got um, the component annotation, we've got the bean annotation on a method in a configuration class. We also have a bunch of other annotations, we've looked at all of these earlier, and all of these get turned into beans. Um, they are all component or a specialization of components. So when your application starts, each and every one, each and every uh, class that's annotated one of those or um, method in a configuration class that's annotated with the bean annotation will get turned into a bean. And when you start up your app, they're all processed first. And this is, uh, this concept, the fact that things are separated here. So we have user configuration, um, which is triggered by component scan or configuration classes in your application or bean methods in your configuration XML classes. XML config if you Yeah, you could import. Yeah, so that's another thing I guess it's worth um, pointing out. While Spring Boot is, um, we believe Java config is the best way to do things and we would encourage you to use it. You don't have to use Java config to use Spring Boot. If you're trying to adopt Spring Boot and you already have an existing framework app and you've invested heavily in XML, and you don't want to move to Spring Boot and convert all your XML to Java config at the same time, you don't have to. You can use uh, the import resource annotation on your main class to import some existing XML-based config into your app, and it will work just as it did in a traditional Spring Framework application. So it can be quite a useful technique while you're uh, migrating to Spring Boot. And we have no plans to remove the XML support, so it's something that you can, uh, you can rely on for the, the foreseeable future. So yeah, there's all these beans are created as part of the user configuration. And then as kind of a second phase, the enable auto configuration annotation kicks in. And it looks at all the auto configuration that's available on the class path and creates beans for it. Um, and this separation is really important because the ordering, yes, question. Okay, uh, I'll repeat the Have question for this I'll repeat the question for the recording because you weren't. So the question was, um, correct me if I'm paraphrasing this incorrectly. You were using import resource in a Spring Boot application, and you're also using Cucumber for testing, and you couldn't get the combination of import resource, Spring Boot, and Cucumber to mm -hmm. work together. I don't know. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it's, it's very specific details, so I, I guess it's better if we take that offline, you explain yeah, us a um, bit more about your yeah, project. Yeah, or open an issue and we'll, we'll do I can't tell you off the top of my head, it's not something I've seen before. But Cucumber has, a, has its own runner, so that might yeah, be... Yeah, Cucumber does have its own test runner, so there's, there's a few moving parts there. Um, and I know they do have Cucumber Spring integration, so there's... Yeah, I'm not sure where Let, the Let's is. chat at the, at the break, probably, okay? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so the, uh, the configuration is split into two, so there's all the user configured beans and then there's all the auto configured beans. And that separation is really important for how some of the condition processing works because it allows the condition evaluation on the auto configuration, which is kind of the, um, the fundamental thing that enables Spring Boot's convention over configuration model. So the conditions are what lets us um, have strong opinions, but to hold them weakly so that we can back off and get out your way when you tell us that you know better and say, I don't want your auto configured bean, use this one instead, please. And the fact that these things happen in two separate phases allows the auto configuration to look at the context in a known state with all of your beans already there. It decides whether or not it needs to um, add beans to the context. And we'll dig into that a bit more later on. So, enable auto configuration. What exactly um, does that do? Let's see what, uh, what it looks like to write your own. Okay, so for that, I'm going to initiate the new project so, structure. By the way, we'll share the link to, um, to this GitHub project at the end. Um, there is one commit per demo, so you can go back uh, if there is something that you didn't get immediately, or ping us on Twitter or whatever. Happy to explain. Um, but if you want to to uh, use that project again, um, 
there is one commit per sample. So um, I'm going to create a new project structure that's called LO starter, which is here. Uh, that's supposed to be our custom starter for the uh, LO service library. And we have a LO, to LO auto configuration that's empty for now, so the purpose is that we are going to, to code something. And we have a test. And I think that the testing part is quite important because um, like I explained, when you, when you work with auto-configuration, you need to start the context in various manner. So you need to start the context with a certain user configuration, start the context with no user configuration, start the context with some property override, start the context with some beans being present or not. And you want to check that the auto-configuration will adapt to that. And uh, there is a pattern that we use a lot in Spring Boot for that, which is to all the context um, and have a load method that creates the context, adds the auto configurations that are necessary, and in each test you basically create, simulate the user configuration. So in this case, what I want to do is I want to load an empty configuration. So if you look at empty, empty configuration, it doesn't do anything. It's supposed, it's supposed to, to, to simulate the fact that the user didn't express any preference about that particular service. And what I want to do is I want to assert that the context has one bin of type hello service. So I can, I can ask the context, give me your state. Um, oh, I can't do that because hello service is not in the class pass. Gotcha. So dependencies, if you want to create your own starter, um, there are really two ways to do it. Um, I will go with the simple one now. Um, the simple one is to ship the code and the starter in the same project. So you add the dependencies to the library and you code your auto configuration in that very same project. If you want to be a bit more extensible, uh, like we are in Spring Boot for obvious reasons, you, you will have one module with the auto configuration code and optional dependencies to the various libraries that you want to auto configure, and separately a starter that will bring that module and the dependency that you think are the base to get started. <laughs> so for instance, if you look at Spring Boot, if you, if you get Spring Boot Starter Web, you'll get the auto configuration module, Tomcat, Spring MVC, and, and the GSR 303 validation. In this case, we are going to, to, to put everything together. So um, I need to get started. Um, I need to get the base infrastructure for Spring Boot, and I need a dependency to my Hello service. Now I have that. I can assert that there's one, right? And I can run this. And as you may expect, it will fail. It will fail because there is no such being in the context. So let's, let's code our auto configuration. And as you'll notice, an auto configuration is really, really very similar to a configuration class. So if you've, if you've used Java config already, it will feel very similar to you. So another configuration is a configuration. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to do the stupid thing for the moment. I'm going to create an LO service bean, like this. The only difference, and the main difference, between a configuration class and an auto configuration class is when that class is being picked up by Spring Boot. So we don't use component scanning at all. Um, what we do is we register the auto configuration class at a known place. It's a file called uh, Spring Factories. So I'm going to create that now. Uh, resources. So in the meta inf directory, you create a file called uh, Spring Factories. And in that file, you're going to reference the auto configuration that you have. How many of you here are familiar with Spring.factories already? How many of you have? used it. Interesting. Maybe a, a third, quarter or a third. So there's a, it's a general extension mechanism in the framework. So there's a, a helper class that you can use, um, Spring Factories Loader, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. um, and you can call that and basically say, give me an instance of everything um, that is of a particular type. Um, and Spring Framework uses it in a number of places, and Spring Boot uses it in, in a number of places. And it's a really nice uh, plug-in mechanism. You just have as Stefan's showing here, the spring.factories file, and you just list key value pairs in it, 
So the key indicates the type, and the value equals the thing that is of that type. And then you can just ask spring.factories, give me all of uh, everything that's found via spring.factories on the class path that's of a particular type, and it will load them for you. Um, so it's a kind of a uh, springs take on the, uh, the JRE service loader, if you like. Mm -hmm. So the key here is that you don't have to, the, the user, obviously, the user of your auto configuration doesn't have to do anything. By the mere presence of the jar file in the project, this entry will be read, as we will uh, discuss a bit after. Um, that uh, class will be found, and Spring Boot will attempt to look at whether or not it has to do something with that auto configuration. So my test is now passing, and what I can do is, rather than using the, s the library directly, I can use the starter for it and start my app again. And we see that something is wrong um, with our app now. It's wrong because my custom prefix is gone. So remember, in the I expressed a, um, an opinion about that service because the auto configuration didn't exist, or I just prefer that prefix. I don't want the default one. So I've, I've, I've told Spring Boot, this is my user config. I want this. And still, um, Spring Boot basically overrode my, my choices. So we'll understand in a minute why. All right, so let's just recap what Stefan covered with auto configuration and kind of the, the low level stuff you have to do to write one. Because this is, this is the key thing. If you want to start writing your own Spring Boot starters and write auto configuration for maybe common code that you've got in your organization um, that you want to share among a team of developers or across teams, this is the like this is the real kind of the the root of it. What you really need to do. So there's the metarim spring.factories file, and you use as the key the fully qualified class name of the enable auto configuration um, annotation, and then every value. So it's a comma separated list. So um, in properties file format. Um, so you can split things onto multiple lines as long as you escape with the backslash, as you can see here. Um, so we just have one entry, hello auto configure, hello auto configuration. But you can add multiple entries, um, comma separate them. And as Stefan showed, when you have a class, um, which so the hello auto configuration in the fully, quali fully qualified package that was listed in the spring.factories file, that will automatically be found when you enable auto configuration in your Spring Boot app. And then it's loaded just in exactly the same way as any other configuration classes. So the, the, uh, the techniques that you can use in that configuration class, they're all exactly the same. So you have, um, you have your bean methods in there. You annotate it with configuration. You can inject dependencies into your configuration class just as you would in a normal one. Um, oh, it might be worth mentioning another improvement in Spring Framework. Um, 4.3. Before 4.3, if you're writing a configuration class, you had to use field injection um, into your configuration classes. In 4.3 and later, you can use constructor injection in a configuration class. So you can declare any dependencies um, as final and then write um, uh, and then just assign them in your configuration class's constructor. Um, I personally think that field injection is a bad idea in your main code. In configuration classes, it's not quite so clear cut, I don't think, because you don't often try to unit test them. And I think that's the biggest problem with field injection is it makes unit testing difficult. But I still personally do quite like the fact that you can declare them as final. Um, so in Spring Boot, we have, we, when we upgraded to Spring Framework 4.3, we converted all of our configuration classes to use constructor injection. So, but it's, it's really a preference thing. And if you told me that you would carry on doing field injection, then fine. I don't really have a good argument. Um, but our preference in the boot team is uh, constructor injection. So we saw. Can you get back to the last slide? Uh, but we still have to get the beat here and in the factory uh, file as well. So the question was you have to declare the bean here um, and in the factory file as well. Um, so there are two things. Uh, yes, you have to declare something in the factory file. The factory file isn't referring to the bean. It's referring to the class. So it's referring to hello auto configuration. And then the configuration class is providing, in this case, just one bean. But it could provide 10 beans, 20 beans, whatever makes sense for this unit of configuration. And it, it can also import other configuration. Yeah, so you could... Um, yeah. 
I touched a bit on the fact that this configuration class can do anything that a normal configuration class could do. Um, if you were auto-configuring something and that made sense for it to contribute 100 beans to your application, you might not want to put 100 bean methods in one configuration class. You might want to break it up a bit. Um, and you can use uh, the import annotation to reference other configuration classes that this one should import, which lets you basically compose a bunch of smaller units together into one, um, one big uh, configuration class that is switched on as a single piece of auto configuration. And you can also import, you could use import resource to pull in some XML as part of an auto yeah, configuration don't do that. as well. Don't do that. <laughs> but all of that is available to you um, should you want to make use of it. So Stefan talked a little bit before um, about how the, what we showed you so far was a bit stupid because um, you know, I talked about convention over configuration and it being strongly opinion, strong opinions weakly held. What Stefan showed you thus far is it has a strong opinion and it's holding it strongly. So it's being pretty obnoxious and belligerent. It's like, no, I know better. You're not getting to use your prefix. Um, you're it's using the default one. It's or, just a sample, you know, and fix it. <laughs> so what can we do to make that better? How can we improve our auto configuration? Right. So once we have this infrastructure, um, so what we want to do, obviously, is if you define a, a bin of type hello service, you've ex expressed a, an opinion, and we absolutely need to honor that. So we, we shouldn't create, we shouldn't auto-configure that service if you've pro pro provided one. So the first thing I'm going to do, uh, like we should always do, is write a test for it. So I'm going to say default service backs of if user provided, for instance. And I'm going to load a user configuration. So that, that's what I meant with this, this load method that actually allows you to simulate an environment. So let's go with the user configuration, which has nothing in it. And let's, um, let's just express something. So I'm creating a bean. I'm going to call that um, bean of type hello service my yellow service, and I'm going to say uh, mine, some kind of prefix there, which are different, okay? Then I'm going to assume, um, I'm going to check, sorry, that I have one bean. I'm going to get it, because that, that assertion will, will pass, and say hello with some message. And the only thing I, I didn't show is we have a rule here called output capture, uh, which we use quite a lot, which allows us to uh, capture the, the system out and basically perform assertion on them. And that's a, um, it's in Spring Boot test, I think. So if you have um, something of your own that, uh, well, in this case, it's, it's not particularly testable because it's just outputting to the console. Um, but if you have something similar where you want to test that console output is what you want it to be, you can use output capture um, in your own tests. Uh, it's available in the Spring Boot test module. So if I run that, um, it doesn't work because I have two beans. And the reason why I have two beans is because that's going to expose a, na a bean named my hello service. And the auto configuration that's rather stupid is going to expose another bean, with which is named hello service. So how can I make my, my auto configuration smarter? The first thing I probably need to do, and we will come back on that later, is to say if hello service isn't there, let's just skip it completely. So this is a flag, this is something you should do to prevent your auto configuration to kick in if the target library isn't present. In this case of this sample, it's a bit stupid because the code um, is in the same module as the starter, which will bring uh, the dependency, but you could obviously exclude that. But in practice, always make sure that you guard your auto configuration, uh, make sure that they don't kick in if the things you want to auto configure isn't present. And then if I want to make sure that this uh, bin is not created, it's very easy. I just have to say conditional on missing bin on it. So if I run that, my test pass. So conditional on missing bean takes an attribute where you define the type of the bean or the name of the bean that you're looking for. And there is a convention, if you put that on a bean method, it will use the return type of the method by default. 
So conditional on missing bin empty there on the method reads. If there is a, a bin of, of the same type as the return type of the method, do not create the bin. So now I can run my app. And um, uh, my prefix should be honored now. I'm back with Audi. That's what I want. So finally, finally, after all that, I can actually get rid of um, you know the the 300 lines of configuration of, of this very complex service. I can let the auto configuration do do its magic for me. No magic. Do its work. So removing that, and well, we have a problem. We are back with the stupid prefix. So that's the next step. The next step, what we want to show you is how you can make your auto configuration smarter. How can you make that, um, how can you expose keys so that the user can customize things without having to redefine everything? You're hopefully familiar um, in a Spring Boot app using application.properties or application.yaml um, to declare and customize Spring Boot's configuration. That's what we want to do now here. Um, you don't have to use a, when you want to override an opinion or reconfigure something slightly, you can declare a bean, but it's a bit cumbersome. Um, you know, you're, in, even that was, you know, four or five lines, essentially just to change one or two values. Um, and obviously as your auto configuration gets more complex, then replacing all of the beans just to customize it will similarly get more complex. So you can expose and make use of the application properties and application YAML. You can make use of that in your own auto configuration as well and allow people to externalize that configuration and, uh, and tweak things more easily. And that's what we're going to do now in, uh, in the little sample. So we have two, two settings for our very complex auto config, the prefix and the suffix. So um, if you want to expose that to, it, to the environment, the way to do it properly is to create an object model for it. So this is what I have. Uh, it's a simple POJO with Java bin properties, nothing really fancy. And you can see that the default value are being set in code, uh, which is important. We'll come back on that in a minute. Now I want to bind that object to a certain area of the environment. So for instance, if you want to change the port in Spring Boot, you need to, you, you need to use the server.port uh, property. And server is, is the namespace, if you will, of the, of the configuration of the server. So if you want to bind a POJO to the environment, you need to use a configuration properties annotation, and you need to give it a, a prefix. So what, what that's going to do concretely, it's going to expose or it's going to bind two, uh, key, two keys in the, in the environment, one that's called hello.prefix and one that's called hello.suffix. So the idea here, of course, is that I'm going to use that property and have my custom prefix rather than having to reconfigure everything. So to do that, um, very easy. I can just inject, and we'll see it, it won't work. I can just inject the properties there. You can see that IntelliJ is telling me something is wrong. And just pass the information. So since the default are the same, and then I will, I'll get the same behavior uh, out of the box, and if I'm adding extra stuff, um, then it will work. I should have created a test for that. Okay, let me create a test for it. Okay. So let's say um, hello prefix equals test. Then I can uh, basically do that. Uh, and like this. Right? Something like that. Do you want to just focus a bit on the environment test utils and how you're yes. um, setting that Yes, good catch. So the, the load method not only takes a user configuration, but a, a list of keys that you may set in application properties. So not only can you simulate the, the user configuration, you can simulate that, we've already seen it, but you can also simulate what the user would put in application properties and check that your auto configuration is going to react accordingly. So there is one problem, though. Um, this is not a bean. And again, uh, auto configuration does not use class pass scanning. So it's not because you, you put some component there that it will be automatically scanned. Uh, we don't do that. Um, there's also one more reason why we don't do this, is creating that as a bean doesn't make any sense if the hello service library is not present. You're not going to create it, it's going to be useless anyway because that auto configuration is not going to kick in. 
So what you can do is uh, enable processing of that um, object explicitly, and you can see it's being resolved now. Okay, picture. picture. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. So let's go with the test. It should work, hopefully. It doesn't. Why? Test. Oh, okay. Probably a uppercase minor case problem. Oh, yeah. That's because it's a question mark by default. There we go. So now I, I, I can basically benefit from that in my app. Uh, as you'll see, it's very easy. Let's type hello, the prefix equals Audi. That's what we had before, right? And start the app. There we go. So you're back with that experience of, I want to change that tiny bit. Um, I agree with most of the auto configuration, but there is this part I don't agree. And I don't want to know how that thing is configured. In this case, again, it's very easy, but imagine like you want to configure Hibernate without going to Stack Overflow to understand how it works. So if you want to do that, and you want to only change one bit, you don't want to start digging into this and, and, and try to understand how that works. You just want to look, OK, there is this property that allows me to change that area of the config, and just let the auto configuration works with your customization. I'm not so happy, though, um, because you've seen that uh, the ID is complaining that it doesn't know about that property. It would be so nice if you could get the auto-completion for it. It would be so nice if the ID would know about it, would know the default value, would know the documentation about it. Um, so let's do that. How many of you are familiar with the auto-complete support in the various ID? Were you aware that that was? Who doesn't know about that stuff? Quite a Interesting. OK, so. What, uh, what ID are you using? Those who, do, who don't know about that stuff, what ID are you using? Are you using Eclipse? Well, let's, have a, let's have a show of hands. Who's okay. using Eclipse or STS? Who's using uh, IntelliJ IDEA? <laughs> and, Sorry. And There's only one using NetBeans. And, and who's using NetBeans? Ah, that's you. Oh, oh well, we have three. <laughs> More than one. Well, then, if you use if for the for the three using NetBeans, um, kidding aside, there's a really great plugin. It's called um, NB Spring Boot NB, plugin. NB Spring Boot. If yeah. you if you type, you say yes, but then you should know about that stuff. Well, no, but uh, well, I just uh, don't do this plugin recently, so I don't know about the how to fill the auto auto complete with the okay. with okay. the profiles so and such stuff. So all three IDEs that we mentioned, STS or Eclipse, um, uh, IntelliJ has to be Ultimate Edition? I'm afraid, yes. Yes. Um, Those guys need to make a little bit of money, you know? Yeah, OK, fair enough. Uh, or NetBeans. So Eclipse STS free, NetBeans free, IntelliJ costs you a little bit of money. Um, but it's good. But it's good, yeah, absolutely. Um, you can't tell I'm an Eclipse user, can you? Um, mm. All three of them have plugins uh, that basically means application property file and application YAML files, you'll get autocomplete suggestions uh, while you're configuring. So you can type server dot and it'll give you a bunch of suggestions. Um, but you can also plug into that so that if you've written your own auto configuration and you want to tell, uh, say you provided a library for another development team to use with some auto configuration, you say all of the configuration is under you know my library dot, then they can type my library, trigger the auto completion, and they'll get to see um, all of the properties that are on offer. Was there a So the question is about injecting the hello properties into another configuration class. Did you mean this? How can we make sure this is a bean, you mean? OK, so, so the question is, um, so there are a few pieces here. We've used configuration properties to annotate a POJO, basically, the kind of Java bean style thing with a bunch of fields and a bunch of getters and setters. And that's the thing that's going to receive all of the configuration that's coming from application properties or application YAML. And there's the enable uh, configuration properties annotation, which is the thing that switches it on. 
as Stefan mentioned, you only want to enable configuration properties for something if that thing is available. So for example, in, um, in Spring Boot, we have a bunch of properties for configuring the server. So we have server.port, uh, server.access log, whatever. We have some Tomcat specific properties, undertow specific properties, etc. If you're not writing a web application, we don't want any of the server stuff to kick in. So rather than the server properties being, being just something that's there all the time, it's explicitly enabled via the enable configuration properties annotation. Um, so and, and that will only kick in if the configuration class where it's declared, if the conditions mean that it's being used. And when enable configuration properties switches something on, there's some infrastructure that hooks into the application context and creates a bean for it. So it is turned into a bean, and um, as part of that bean's creation, it's post-processed to set all of the values into it based on what you've configured in system properties, the, the, uh, you know, the OS environment, application properties files, et cetera. So this, this annotation does not turn that into a bean. It's just a flag to tell, this is the prefix on, of the environment you should bound to. And then after that, if you want to use it, then you explicitly um, <coughs> enable it like, like Andy just explained. So that's going to turn that into a bean, which means I can inject there, inject it there and benefit from whatever the user has configured. Right. So our, um, where are we on time? Uh, we have nine minutes until the break. Oh boy. Okay. So this is still unknown, right? So we want to fix it. And you, you remember I mentioned that creating a POJO, so creating a model for it, uh, was very important. And it's not only very important because then you can inject that into your own co auto configuration <coughs> and retrieve bits and pieces of the environment which are without having to write some, some code, like asking the environment directly for keys. You're just having a model for it. But there's an added benefit is if you do that, then you can add a, an annotation processor. You can add a single dependency to your project that's going to detect that annotation and do something for you. So it's called a Spring Boot configuration processor. It, it runs at compile time. And it will basically find all the classes that have configuration properties on them and scan the source code at compilation time and generate a metadata, metadata file for you. So let's see if that worked. It didn't. Need to refresh, usually. There we go. So it's going to generate this. And that is, is a format that we've defined. And the three IDs support, support this format. So now if I type hello, I'll get auto-completion. OK, very simple. If I want to go back to my properties object, um, hello properties. <coughs> and write some super smart description here. That super smart description is taken automatically, so hopefully that should work. Yes. Okay. And if I autocomplete like, like you used to, you get the, the description here right away. All right, so let's just recap some of what we've seen there, how we made our auto configuration a little bit smarter. So we saw two conditions being used. Conditional on class um, is something to use when you have an optional dependency. So that's kind of the signal that you should use. If you're ever writing some auto configuration and you declare a dependency in your project that's providing auto configuration, if you consider that dependency to be optional, then you should be using conditional on class to mean that you only try and configure it when it's on the class path. We use conditional on missing bean to kind of back off and move a bean out of the way when the user who's of your auto configuration wanted to express their own opinion about how a particular bean should be configured. There are a bunch of other conditions all built into Spring Boot. So there's conditional on bean, which is kind of the opposite of missing bean. So you might want to respond, if something else is there, then I can use that and build on top of it to do something else. So you want, might want to make some configuration conditional on a bean already being there. Conditional on missing class is the opposite of conditional on class. So you might want to offer some auto configuration that behaves differently depending on what's on the class path. And maybe you want to fall back. So maybe you're, uh, say you're doing something with an HTTP client. 
and your preference is to use OK HTTP, for example. But if there's no uh, kind of nice, more sophisticated HTTP client library on the class path, you might want to find, uh, provide kind of a rudimentary basic version that just uses the HTTP support in the JDK. So you might want to use conditional on missing class for a particular HTTP client. Say, well, if that's, that client's not there or if none of these clients are there, you can pr pass in multiple classes. Say, if, if all of those are missing, then I'll just provide this kind of rudimentary version to keep things working rather than making the whole context fall in a heap because a particular bean isn't there at all anymore. Condition on property, so that's uh, we saw that ties into the configuration property stuff. That basically looks in the environment and lets you say, uh, this property needs to be there. Um, if it isn't, um, or if it is and it has a particular value, then do this, please. So, um, sorry, that, that one is pretty useful if, you, if your auto configuration cannot determine everything. So the user has to provide some basic setup for you to actually do something. Uh, usually, you would expose that as properties, one property or two properties, depending on uh, how complex the use case is. And by adding that, uh, you are sure that you, you, won't, you won't have to mess with a situation where the user hasn't provided that, uh, that, that uh, configuration. Um, we have a condition on web an uh, application or a condition on not web application, although the latter may go away in Spring Boot 2. Um, in fact, in Spring Boot 2, this is an interesting point, condition on web application has got a bit more sophisticated. So up until Spring, I'm um, including Spring Boot 1.5, a web application was a web application. It was serverlet-based. Um, in Spring Boot 2.0, the whole reactive web stack is available. Um, so there's now two different types of web application. You can have a serverlet-based one or a reactive one. So you can now say, I'm conditional on this being any sort of web application, or conditional on specifically being a serverlet-based web application, or conditional on specifically being um, a, reactive a reactive web application. Conditional on resource, um, I only want to switch this on if uh, something's available via Spring's resource app, uh, abstraction, so on the class path, the file system, for example. Um, conditional on single candidate, a bit like conditional on bean, but you're saying, I only switch this on if there's one and only one uh, bean of this particular type. Conditional on Java, if you have functionality that requires a particular version of Java and yet you, um, you want your auto configuration to support multiple versions. Um, so we've used this quite a lot in Spring Boot when before we raised the baseline to Java 8, but we wanted to offer Java 8 specific enhancements. Then we could say, well, only configure this stuff if the user's running on Java 8. For example, we do some fancy stuff with um, some of the new uh, support in Java Util Concurrent that came in Java 8. Uh, conditional on JNDI, if you're running on an application server and you want to say only do this if there's something available in uh, JNDI, so you can pass in the, uh, the lookup, um, the JNDI reference thing that you want to be us to check is there. Um, and last, and in my opinion least, because it gives you lots of opportunity to shoot yourself in the foot, um, conditional on expression. So this you can basically put any spell expression in a condition and it's evaluated to true or false and things will happen, um, you know, the condition is switched on or off. It's quite expensive. Spell expressions are um, not cheap to evaluate, particularly if you, if you go a bit wild with it. Um, use with caution. I think about 99 out of 100 uses of conditional expression I've seen could have been done with conditional on property. Um, so always try and use conditional on property first rather than reaching for conditional on expression. Three minutes. Okay, um, we might break a little bit early, but let's carry on. So enable auto configuration, which Stefan showed us. Let's just recap what happens there. So enable auto configuration triggers Spring Boot to look in the spring.factories file and find a bunch of configuration classes. So in this case, we've got four configuration classes that we're auto configuration classes that we're interested in. And those auto configuration classes, they all have conditions on them that are evaluated. Or if they don't have conditions on them, as in the top left, so the alpha auto configuration, an auto configuration has no conditions, it's just switched on by default. Nothing more happens. If Bravo auto configuration has a single condition on it and it didn't match, so the whole configuration class is forgotten about. Charlie auto configuration in the bottom left has two conditions on it. They both have to match for that, config that configuration class to apply. And lastly, the Delta Auto Configuration class, it has two conditions on it, and the first one did not match. 
And at that point, we just stop. We don't bother evaluating any of the other conditions. We short circuit the condition evaluation. So we've got these uh, configuration classes. Let's focus in on one of them um, that had some conditions on it. Once the conditions on a particular configuration class have passed, only then do we bother looking at any beans that are declared on it and evaluate any of the conditions that are declared on any of the bean methods. So for a particular bean that's in a configuration class, an auto configuration class, to be created, all of the conditions on the class have to match and all of the conditions on the bean method have to match. If, none of, if, if any of them don't match, the bean will not be created. So here's all of the conditions. Again, three of these aren't like the others because they depend on beans in the context. And this comes back to the point we we're making before about user configuration and auto configuration being processed in two separate phases. Conditional on single candidate, conditional on bean, conditional on missing bean, look for other beans in the context to decide what to do. So the fact that they're processed in an auto configuration class after all of the user's configuration has been processed is what lets Spring Boot back off when you've provided your own bean. If we evaluated all of the conditions and all of the configuration together, there's the danger that the auto configuration would say, oh, conditional on missing bean, let's have a look in the context. And the user's configuration hasn't been processed yet, and hasn't had a chance to create the bean, and Spring Boot wouldn't back off because the condition evaluation happened before the user's bean was there, which is why it's vital that the user's configuration is processed first, and then auto configuration is processed. And I think last point before the break, um, we process all of the configuration classes in a particular order. It's not the order that they're declared in your source code, the annotations in the order that you've declared on them, but the actual implementations of the condition declare orders on them, and we evaluate them in fastest to evaluate to slowest to evaluate, which is why the short circuiting is useful. So for example, condition on class is very cheap and easy to evaluate. Conditional on missing bean or any of the bean related conditions, conditional on expression, they're all quite expensive um, because we have Relatively to, speaking. Relatively speaking. And we're talking milliseconds still, a handful of milliseconds, but it can add up. So if you care about startup time um, and you're writing custom conditions, then think about ordering them so that if it's cheap and quick to evaluate, give it a nice high order, high precedence so that it will run quickly and will short circuit and then won't bother with any more expensive um, condition evaluation. Right, let's do that after the break. Right, I think, as soon as we've hit the, uh, we'll juggle things, we were gonna do this and then the break, but let's juggle things around a bit. I think we've got a, still about 10 minutes. Um, so let's have a quick break, get up, stretch your legs if you want to, and we'll, uh, we'll resume at uh, 12.30. Welcome back. So yeah, we, we had one, uh, you, you said two questions, but we had one great question. Um, question was, um, the auto configuration is a configuration. Uh, so let's, let's look at the code, it will be easier to understand. What happens if this class is actually target of component scanning? So what if hello.autoconfigure, or let's say you, you, you specify component scan on hello. As we've discussed before, hello.autoconfigure is a child of that, so it should be picked up by component scanning. Turns out it was the case before. So the auto configuration would be added to the user configuration wrongly, because it, it's a configuration class, right? So it will be detected as any other configuration class. Um, what we've done in the meantime in Spring Boot, and that's what you see actually. We had a quick look to it. <coughs> We have this auto configure exclude filter. So we basically have a filter if that class is defined as, a dot as an auto configuration, we'll exclude it. Because otherwise it's very confusing. If you don't put your auto configuration in a dedicated package, so outside of the package space of your application, you had the danger well, of that auto configuration to be picked up as a regular configuration class, which is definitely not what you want. Let's go. So um, let's create a custom condition. Well, yeah, so... Ah, you had still another question? Uh, no, I just wanted to uh, introduce the next bit a little bit. Um, okay. So uh, before the break, we walked through all of the conditions that Spring Boot offers you um, out of the box. 
um, which hopefully gets you quite a long way in terms of what you would like to be able to, how you'd like to be able to switch things on and off in your own uh, auto configuration. But the model is completely extensible. You can write your own conditions. Um, so that's what we're going to do now. We'll enhance the sample with a custom condition. So again, um, so far we, we had so many great use cases that made sense. So let's, let's keep up with that for the sample. And what we want to do is we want to be a bit, um, a bit crazy. And if the prefix property isn't present, or and that's where the crazy part is, if the, if the prefix starts with a lowercase, which we want to disable the creation of the beam. So we, we are going to create a condition for that. So first thing we need to do is to create a few tests for that. Yep, that's the one. <coughs> So default service is not auto-configured if prefix is missing. So I'm basically loading an empty config with no configuration. And I need to assert that I have no bean. That's my first test. And my second test, default service is not auto-configured with wrong prefix. I'm going to pass that a hello prefix invalid. Doesn't start with an uppercase. And I'm going to say also it's empty. Again, it's not very um, interesting and quite quite simple. But what's really interesting is the uh, the infrastructure. Around. My my two tests are aren't passing at the moment. So let's create this custom condition. No, that's not the one I was looking for. So if you want to create a custom condition, you basically need to write a class. And that class will, will get some metadata about where you've put the condition. So usually, what, as you would expect, I'm going to uh, enable this condition. So let's do that right away so that it's easier to understand. I'm going to add this condition here, this e extra condition. <coughs> So because I've added that implementation on this particular method, um, I'm going to get some um, metadata about where it's being defined. So this allows you to add extra parameters, for instance. But in this case, I'm not going to do any of that. Um, I'm going to get the hello prefix. I'm going to check if the prefix contains that, that hello namespace sorry, contains a property named prefix. And if there is one, I'm going to check if the first character is an uppercase. So in that case, everything is fine. My condition matches. And as you can see, I have a condition not come of match. If that's not the case, then I'm going to, uh, so either it's not an uppercase or either it's not present, I'm going to return a no match. And as you can see, uh, you get a very nice DSL to build the um, the reason why the auto configuration did not match. How many of you are familiar with the auto configuration report in Spring Boot? How many of you have ever seen that when you start your app? Ooh, that's not, not a lot. No. Okay, let's see. Let's see that now then. So you can um, both when you're writing your own auto configuration um, and when you're trying to figure out what Spring Boot's auto configuration is doing. Um, if you start your app with uh, the debug flag, so you can pass in just dash dash debug. Um, on the command line when you start your app. It will output a report for you that will tell you all of the auto configuration classes that it found and all of the conditions on those classes that it evaluated and whether it decided whether the conditions matched or did not match. So it will let you see, for example, if you're starting your app and you're expecting it to be a web app and for some reason it just started up and shut down and uh, you know, none of your web endpoints worked, you could look at the auto config report and maybe notice that Tomcat wasn't on the class path, for example, and you'll see that um, there are a bunch of conditions that were looking for Tomcat and they, um, they, were, uh, they didn't match. And the, uh, the DSL that Stefan showed you in building that message in your custom condition, that information is included in the auto configuration report. So you can explain to a user of your auto configuration report what it was that your condition was looking for that was or wasn't present so that they can understand why the condition matched or did not match. Right, so now that I have added the code, um, I'm basically creating, uh, I, I can basically run my test again. That should pass now. 
they do. So let's let's basically break the thing and see what happens. Uh, so in my app here, I'm going to put a lowercase there. And then something I something interesting will happen if I'm starting the app instead of the test. So the bin will not be created. And um, because of that, the application won't start. But what's interesting is that now that we have an auto configuration that, ma that, cou that could have matched, we know about that stuff, and we will actually show you that. So in this case, rather remember at the first, the very first demo, um, we had something. The action was uh, consider defining a bin of that type uh, because none were present and no auto configuration pr were present. Now we have, thanks to that uh, infrastructure, you can we can actually retrieve that information and give you the uh, exact. Um, the exact reason why the bin wasn't created. That's still not a conditional on that you that you used to. So what does it take to create a conditional on annotation for your custom um, your custom condition? So let's say conditional on valid hello prefix. And that must be an interface. An annotation. So you need to be very careful about that stuff to always copy paste that thing. Always forget what it is. But if you don't do that, you don't get the retention. And how do you turn that into a condition? It's very easy. You basically flag that as a condition with the, the, the type of the condition. Simply that. The advantage of doing this, there are two advantages. One is that the, the implementation now is hidden. You don't expose that implementation in your API. And two, you can add attributes to the uh, annotation. So if you want to customize the way the condition works. So for example, conditional on class has an attribute, which is the class um, to look for. And then Stefan mentioned earlier in your condition implementation, you're past the context and the annotation metadata um, for the condition, so then you can retrieve any attributes that you declared on your annotation and get access to them. So if someone has uh, customized your condition a little um, to say, you know, conditional on a specific class or conditional on a specific property, that's how um, those conditions in Spring Boot work. And the last thing is, uh, once you have that, then you can use the uh, you can use the source of the annotation to build uh, the message builder. And when you do that, it will improve the error message. So now you have bin method hello service in hello auto configuration not loaded because conditional on valid hello prefix rejected the prefix Audi as it doesn't start with an uppercase character. So that's the kind of message you can build. And we will cover you back and we will display that in the error report as we will see uh, later how it works. Question right in the back. Yep. So the question was, does this also work with bean validation properties like at not null uh, and things like that? Um, oh, you mean the, On the properties? Uh, you mean the error message? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> as simple as that. <laughs> yes. So um, we will cover. We will cover. So the this this nice um, error report that you have, we will actually cover. In this presentation, we'll explain how that works. And there is one for validation issues. Break, that was good. Right, uh, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, traps to avoid, things that you can get wrong, common gotchas um, that we see users do and also that we made uh, you know, in the early days of Spring Boot when we were getting used to this stuff. Um, so this question actually came up during the break. So um, imagine you have three auto configuration classes, um, but there are some dependencies between them. So we talked earlier how well, all the user config is processed and then all of the auto config is processed. But what happens about dependencies between auto configuration? Um, and there's an example here. So it's a, a little bit uh, simplified. But say, so here we've got uh, some sort of data access class which is going to use JDBC template. So we want to auto configure that. Um, if there's a JDBC template available. Um, we have a data source auto configuration that's going to create a data source for us. And then we also have some um, JDBC auto configuration that's going to create a JDBC template for us, but only if there's a data source. So hopefully it's clear that there's uh, uh, some dependencies between those three configuration classes. We need the data source 
to be able to create the JDBC template, and we need the JDBC template to be able to create our data access um, object. So we got these three auto configuration classes, um, and we need to order them. So we provide relative ordering annotations. So you can use auto configuration, auto configure after, um, or auto configure before to control the relative ordering of your auto configuration classes. How many of you are familiar with the framework's ordered interface or the order annotation for controlling order of things? Okay, so the core framework has a mechanism for ordering stuff, but it uses absolute values. Um, and there's a problem where those values, they become a bit magic because you stick 10 on something and then everyone needs to know that you've stuck 10 on that because you might want to go, if you want to go before or after it, you need to know if you need to be higher or lower than 10. For the auto configuration, we've gone with the approach of relative ordering so that as long as you know the configuration class that you want to go before or after, you don't care about what its order is absolutely. You just relatively say, I want to go before that or I want to go after that. And Spring Boot sorts them all into the right order based on the relative requirements that they have. So you can stick those two annotations on there. We'll order things appropriately. And then we'll end up, the data source gets created, which goes into the JDBC stuff. So we can create the JDBC template. And then we can create the data access thing. If you write your three auto configurations, then they depend on each other. And it just magically happens to work. Please don't rely on that. Please put the relative annotations on there. It is actually deterministic, the order that they run in. I think it's alphabetical, although I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's alphabetical order of the fully qualified package. Um, but please don't rely on that. You might rename a class, rename a package, um, and then things would break. It's much better to be explicit about it and use the relative ordering annotations um, to keep things in the right order. Another thing you can get wrong, uh, and this came up um, in the break as well. Someone asked about conditional on class and how does that work if you have a configuration class that's conditional on class and you're referencing something that isn't there? Which is a great question. Um, and this example here will blow up because we'll look at JSON auto configuration and it's no conditions on the class. So we'll try and load the class. But when the JVM loads the class, it's going to look at all of the methods. The verifier, when you load a class into the JVM, looks at all the methods and their return types. And it's going to find this bean method that returns a JSON type. Um, and if JSON isn't on the class path, that's going to blow up because we've tried to load the class with that method declaration in it. So what you have to do is put your conditional on class on the class itself. And this works because when we're loading configuration classes, auto configuration classes to begin with and evaluating their conditions, we don't actually load the class. We load the bytecode. So we use ASM to read the bytecode, get the annotation information out of the bytecode. Rather than using reflection to get the annotations, we use ASM. Find all the conditions and evaluate them. And if only if all the conditions match, then do we actually ask the JVM, please load the class. So that means that you can put condition on class on something, and if um, that class isn't there, that configuration class will never even be loaded into the JVM. We'll just read the bytecode and then figure it's not needed and throw it away. Just to remind you again, the split user configuration, auto configuration happens in two separate phases. So this means that you need to be wary of this. If you have some application configuration, so this isn't an auto configuration class. This isn't listed in spring.factories. It's found by component scanning, so it's part of all of the user classes. If you use conditional on missing bean on it, it's probably going to break because you've lost the control then of knowing that all of the user provided beans are definitely going to be there at that point. So you might end up creating this custom bean when actual fact a user configuration is going to run after this configuration class um, and is then going to create another one. So you're going to end up with two, or if they happen to have the same bean name, one is going to override the other one. Um, so there's a warning in the Java doc of conditional missing bean, but you really need to uh, limit yourself to only using bean-related conditions in auto configuration classes that are loaded via spring.factories and not an everyday configuration class that's found by component scanning or an import or what have you in your, your main application code. And if, the, if, if you have like other auto configuration that are supposed to create that bean, you also have to be aware of that and order them um, accordingly. 
So if you want, for instance, to make sure that you do something uh, conditional on a sing single candidate with a certain type, like we explained, make sure that that auto configuration will run after the other auto configuration that are supposed to provide that, that, that bin. <coughs> right. So that's a few gotchas. Um, let's look now a bit about um, the start of the Spring Boot app. Things that go on while you're starting an application. There are various hook points that you can use that might be interesting if you're trying to do something a bit more sophisticated. One thing that you can do is to customize the environment. So I imagine most of you know that you can use application properties and application YAML and things to add things to the environment that are then available via configuration properties or app value. There are other things that you can do to inject things into the environment. And Stefan will uh, show you how that works now. Right. So still with my uh, very interesting use case, um, let's say that on your development machine, you want to customize the prefix. So you want to make sure that if you have a file at a certain location in your home directory, uh, the application will read that, uh, read the value, and override the value um, uh, so that you can use, a, uh, use a, custom, a custom prefix. You can relate to that with more interesting use cases like the location of a database or some settings or some, some password, for instance, that you, you don't want to put in your Git repository. Um, so what I want to show you is how you can do that. Uh, which is a great alternative to property source. So, si so if you've been using property source in the past and being frustrated with it, that's because that's probably not the right tool to do the job. Um, and what I want to show you also is um, show you that um, there are var various sources for the environment. There's various ways of defining properties in Spring Boot. I want you to be aware of that and how you can control the, that, that, um, that ordering when you do an override. So to do that, I'm going to um, add something to my app. Um, and we have an infrastructure that's called the environment post-processor. And environment post-processor is going to be called when the application starts up. Uh, we'll, we'll know more about that in the, uh, in, in the next section. So this, um, so that's the callback that, that you get. You basically get the environment and you get a chance to um, alter it. So I'm, I'm looking for a file called hello settings, which is on this machine. And as you can see, hello.prefix equals high. So what I want to do is if that file is present, so you can, you can basically code whatever business logic you want at this point, then I want to create a new property source. And that's where the ordering is important. I want to make sure that this new property source is added after what you set on the command line. So the, the thing I'm trying to show here is if that thing is on your local machine, uh, then we will use that. But if you specify something as a command line arguments, it will override the things that you put in your uh, file on your file system. So there is a way to override properties, as you know, in Spring Boot. And you can also alter that, that uh, order with your own override. So because this is something that's called very early on, you can't just create a bin for it because it will be way too late to actually process that stuff. So you need to um, ask Spring Boot to look at it and load it on startup. We've seen, to, we've seen that the way to do that is uh, by adding a Spring Factories file and setting a certain key in a, and a comma-separated implementation. Well, guess what? That's exactly what you would do also uh, for the environment post-processor. So in my, in my, in my project, uh, if I can get a handle to the thing there, hello, hello, yes. I need to create a meta-inf, and there I need to create a file called Spring Factories. <coughs> so the key, again, uh, something that you would probably expect is the fully qualified name of the interface, and the value is your implementation, obviously. So if I start my app with that now, um, it says "Hi World," because it, it read that um, it read that that value uh, using your custom um, implementation. I want to quickly uh, switch this this application to a web app to show you something else. With the actuator, and I want to make sure you can access that. So. 
There we go. Right. So if you look at the if you look at the, actu the actuator, it's quite interesting. Uh, you can see all the property sources that contributed to to the environment. Um, so if you go at at the bottom, you'll see uh, the application config and the and and um, the location of the file and what what you've put in in that property file. You'll see also, you'll see also um, system properties, environment properties, and there you'll you'll see the LO local property source, custom property source that we found. So if we go back to the code, uh, this is what you put um, here. So that's the name of the property source that you add to the environment. So let me show you that a bit in a bit more detail. So you add after to the list of property source, you add after the command line one, you had the property source that's named hello local with whatever content you found in whatever file or whatever whatever you've read in, in the logic. The key thing to remember here is the order in the JSON is actually the order of precedence. So as soon as you as, as soon as we'll find a hello dot prefix value, that's the one we are going to use. So we have two at the moment. We have hello prefix high and we have hello prefix how deep. And the first that's defined in the JSON basically wins. And if you're lazy, like I am, then you can also just type that, and you'll get the value that's going to be used. Okay. So quickly now, um, if I'm using a command line switch, so I'm using hello dot prefix, and I'm restarting my app. Something happens. Something different will happen. Ah, I, I forgot to escape it. Wonderful. So, yeah, whatever. But what's key here is if there is uh, some command line arguments, you see that there is a new property source being added before hello local, like I asked for, like I asked for, and that's going to override uh, that custom decision. So, basically, the message is environment post processor gives you all the flexibility to customize the environment and um, fulfill many use cases. Question. Is there a way to get what you want from both? So the question was, is there a way to get this pro processor from a vault or some sort of uh, secure location? Um, so the post processor itself wouldn't come from a secure location, but you could implement a post processor that reads stuff from a vault. Um, and in fact, the Spring Vault and Spring Cloud Vault projects um, do exactly that. They're a, a way to store secrets um, and then inject them into the environment. Um, and the environment post processor is the way to inject them. So the logic that Stefan showed was kind of simplistic for the sake of demonstration. But once you've, once you've hooked into the environment post processor uh, point in the life cycle, you can load things from wherever you like. Um, the local file system, some secure storage somewhere, S3, wh whatever suits your use case. So the environment post processor stuff happens um, uh, as part of or triggered by one of the events that are fired during Spring Boot startup. So we just want to spend a little bit of time talking about those events um, and other um, hook points uh, in the startup of an application to kind of give you an insight into what's going on in the very um, the early days of a Spring Boot application when you start it up, um, up until the point you know the context is refreshed and your application is actually up and running. So you run the application, so you've called Spring Application Run, um, and the very first thing is that an application starting event is fired. And in response to that, um, the logging initialization begins. And this is basically saying to the logging system, this application is being started, and we're going to finish configuring you in a, you know, in a minute, not literally a minute, but in a little while, once we've got all the configuration information we need. So the logging initialization begins, and then we create the environment. So this is you know, the normal Spring Framework environment. Um, so at this point, it hasn't got very much in it. I think it's got environment variables and system properties, and that's about it, because that's what you get in a standard Spring Framework application. We then go and read um, the config files. So this is application properties and application YAML and the profile specific um, versions of those. And the environment is updated, so property sources are added to the environment. And Stefan showed you a bit about the ordering of those. 
So those property sources are added in the right order so that, for example, the um, profile-specific configuration files, their property sources go before the plain application properties files because we want profile-specific configuration to take precedence over the general application configuration. So that ordering is important. Um, and we then call all of the environment post-processors. So at the point when the environment post-processors are called, you know that all of Spring uh, Boot's standard uh, property sources are all going to be in the environment. So you can slot yourself into the relevant point in the ordering to suit the needs um, of your environment post-processor. At this point, we then know that we've got all of the configuration that your boot app needs. And we can then tell the logging system, right, we're all done. All the configuration is there. Finish initializing yourself. So that means that you can use an environment post-processor to, for example, um, configure you might, you, might have, you might be logging to some external service, and so you need some credentials to send the logs to that external service. They might be in a secret store, so you might have an environment post-processor that reads them in. So at the point when the logging system is finally being fired up and is going to start um, appending stuff to wherever it's going that it needs credentials for, gives you an opportunity to hook into that. So if, you, if you've used property source to configure logging and it didn't work, that's the reason why? Um, yeah. It's because we haven't started the context yet. Yeah, the property source annotation um, is only processed the part of refreshing the application context. So it's too late to influence logging because we want to set up logging as early as we can. Um, so if you want to influence logging's configuration in a custom way, use an environment post processor. There was a question, yeah. Um, so it's, uh, the ordering of the property sources is listed in the documentation, um, but it's, uh, oh, so yeah, well, it's that order. But so basically it's defined in, in the documentation. So, um, I think it's kind of environment variables, then system properties, then command line arguments, then profile specific, no, so then, uh, yeah, then profile specific configuration, then general configuration. There's a list in the documentation of about, I think it's about 13 or 14. Mm -hmm. um, I, when you consider there's some options which don't appear here because they're, not, they're just not available. Um, but it's, it's in the documentation. In the, um, I think it's the externalized configuration chapter, there's the list of, that they're all processed in, um, which is a much better resource to look at than me trying to remember. Um, so then uh, logging initializing is complete, and we say, right, the application's prepared. So we're kind of we're ready to go now. And at that point, we refresh the context. Um, and that will result in Spring Framework standard context refreshed event being fired. So when that event is fired, you know the whole context is up and running. Um, but interestingly, your servlet container, if you're writing a web app, won't be accepting connections at this point. It's only after the context is fully refreshed that we start the connectors on the embedded container. And the reason that we do that is that we don't want to start accepting HTTP traffic when your application is still starting because your controllers might not be ready or some beans that may need might not be ready. Hibernate might not have finished setting up your database schema. A flyway migration might still be running. All of those things are guaranteed to have finished by the time the context is refreshed. So when the context is fully refreshed, we know right at that point it's safe to actually ask the embedded container to start its connectors so your web app can start um, serving traffic. Once that's happened, uh, we fire an embedded servlet container initialized event, and it has information in the event about which port your um, application has started on. So um, how many of you have used the testing infrastructure to say, start my web app on a random port? So that, that hooks into this. So when we start, so you do server.port equals zero, is essentially what that random port stuff is doing. That's basically saying to the operating system, I don't care what port you listen on, but please tell me which one you've given me. Um, that is exposed in this event, and then Spring Boot's test infrastructure consumes that event, sees which port it is, and then configures your test appropriately, your REST template or whatever, to communicate on that port. So you can hook into that too if you want, if that port information is interesting and useful to you. Um, once that's happened, we fire the application ready event, and that's basically everything. You're good to go. Your application is fully started at that point. Something else that can happen at startup um, is failure analysis. So we saw some of these before. Um, Stefan showed you, you know, if there was a missing bean, for example, you get kind of a nice message rather than a stack trace. Uh, something we added in Spring Boot 1.4, I think. Yes. Um, so 
as with everything, there's an interface and an entry in spring.factories, um, and there's a bunch of these analyzers. Um, we have one for no such bean definition, uh, no unique bean, so if there's duplicate beans of the same type, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, one for bean currently in creation, if there's a cycle in your beans. Um, so what can this do? How can this help you? We had a user raise a bug, and they pasted this terrifying stack trace into it. It will stop at some point. Um, oh. There we go. There we go. So at the end, it's telling us there are 248 common frames that have been admitted. Um, I don't know about you, but when I see a stat trace like that, I know I'm in for a pretty crappy day. Um, that stat trace was 340 lines long, and it has all the information in it that it needs, all the different chain nested exceptions, but we decided we don't like that. Let's get rid of 340 lines. And instead, the failure analyzer catches the exception and looks at the call, or looks at the chain, up the chain, looking at all of the beans that were involved, and pieces it all together for you, and gives you this nice little diagram. So it's basically, so before, the exception message was saying something like, I couldn't create bean foo because cre bean bar was being created. And then the next exception would say, I couldn't create bar because bean baz was in creation. And you go down all of them. So in this example, how many lines are there? About 10 lines. So there were maybe 10 exceptions, all chained, one beneath the other, all with their stack traces. Kind of, so you're on a magical mystery tour trying to figure out what's going on. So we do that for you in a failure analyzer. We look at all the exceptions, parse information out of the messages and things. And taking inspiration from Elm's compiler, which has some of the, the error messages in Elm's compiler are amazing. Um, and we kind of shamelessly stole the idea to give you this little diagram to show you where the cycle was. Um, and we have a bunch of other failure analyzers, various other things, you've seen some of them. And you can write your own um, with spring.factories and whatnot, um, should you wish. Do you want to show that now? Do you think we have time? Um, maybe I can just, not, not live code, but just skip, skip it and show, show it quickly, very quickly. We have 14 minutes. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, well. Um, so a failure analyzer looks like this. Um, very easy it's an interface that you have to implement and you need to there is a base class that, hallo that allows you to check if the exception that was thrown contains a certain exception type in this case um, in value value prefix exception is a new exception that's being thrown if the prefix has a lower case when that's the case the only thing that you have to do is return a failure analysis that contains the um, that contains the description of the problem what you should do and the exception, the cause, because in debug mode you still want to see the, uh, the exception. So if I'm actually quoting that properly now, and I put a little c there, that should trigger the, uh, the exception message, then you get um, your custom failure analyzer. And what's key is you need a custom exception type so that your failure analyzer is focused if the exception is illegal state exception, that's not going to work so well. So make sure to design uh, those exceptions that are really strongly typed, that's one. And two, make sure to add context, semantic, additional information in the detail of the exception. That way you can retrieve that in the failure analyzer and, and give a better service to the user. And when Stefan says custom exception, he really means one that's um, focused on the specific problem. So legal state exception, he said not good. If the, you're using a third-party library and it often throws an exception at startup if something's misconfigured. Um, if that third-party library gives you an exception that kind of makes it obvious what the problem is, but the stack trace isn't very helpful, then you could write a failure analyzer that targeted the exception from the third-party library. So it doesn't have to be your own custom exception, but just one that's custom kind of specific to the problem that you want to, you want to analyze. And if, if you find use case with Spring Boot where there is such an exception and not a failure analyzer and you think a failure analyzer could help, please create an issue in the tracker and we'll have a look. Um, yeah, and we'll add. We've added a bunch in 1.4, we added some more in 1.5, and if you have more ideas, you know, you have a regular problem at startup and you think we could, if the stack trace doesn't help but a, a nicer message would help, then yeah, let us know, please. Right. Um, let's talk a little about Spring Boot um, startup performance. So we quite often uh, encounter people are saying, my app takes uh, a lot of time to start. Class path scanning is slow. Um, so we'd like to talk a bit about, a bit about that now, because it's, it's not always the case. So people think that they have that problem, um, but it turns out when you dig a little bit, that's not actually what's going on. 
So um, the, the, key, the key thing here is if your application is slow to start, um, our recommendation is actually to, to go a bit deeper, um, trying to understand what is actually slow, which component is taking time. We've done that ourselves, actually, working quite a lot uh, the last few months on this. Um, Dave Sire actually, I think it was two blog posts about it on a GitHub project, I can't remember now. So what he did was monitoring the, the memory consumption on the startup. You'll find a blog um, on Spring.io slash blog about it. He also spent some time to actually analyze what's what was going on um, on startup, trying to cut in pieces which, which part was taking uh, time. And basically, we decided also to, to give that a try uh, in Spring Framework 5, see what we can improve. So um, the question. So you have a Spring Boot application um, with 200 beans and let's say 5,000 classes that we need to look at. And it takes six and a half seconds to start. So how long do we think class pass scanning is going to take to start that? So look at those 5,000 classes and find the 200 beans. So you have a package with 5,000 classes in package and sub packages. We we do class pass scanning on the 5,000, and out of the 5,000, there are 200 classes with add component or add, control, add controller or whatever. So, four options 1.5 seconds out of the six and a half, one second, 500 milliseconds, or 100 milliseconds. So, let's have a show of hands. How many of you think it takes 1.5 out of the 6.5 to scan those 5,000 classes? No one. Oh, a bunch of optimists. No one. <laughs> what about one second? Five percent. Half a second? Almost everyone that are and still alive. who's feeling really optimistic? Who thinks it's only 100? Ah, interesting. Wow. Okay, 20 percent. Okay. The answer is 100 milliseconds. Um, Good job. And Stefan would have really liked to be in this talk about six months ago before he tried to make it faster. <laughs> Yeah, OK. Um, so I basically worked on something that was pretty much useless. Um, <laughs> but it's good for you guys, because uh, you don't have to do anything. Um, so the reason why we know about that, that 100 milliseconds is because we've worked a lot on benchmarks, uh, various scenario, lots of classes, lots of nested, uh, nested uh, packages, lots of noise, so plenty of classes and only a few components. Um, and um, while doing those be benchmarks, we also try to uh, find an alternative uh, to class pass scanning. Uh, that's in Spring Framework 5. So if you, the, key the key message here is if your application is under 50,000 classes that are being scanned, you don't need this. If you have an application that has more than 50,000 classes with class pass scanning, we probably need to talk with you. <laughs> but if you can't change that, then that would be useful because that starts to be very, very useful at that point. So what that thing does, remember, uh, I was adding a dependency earlier, and I explained that it was looking at your source code and generating a JSON file for the idea to completion. Uh, this dependency is exactly the same thing. It's going to scan for your code, uh, scan the, um, the, 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 the classes that basically have a certain, certain annotations on them, it's extensible, so if you have custom, uh, custom annotations, you can use that. It's, it's actually quite great, except we probably won't use it uh, anywhere. Um, and when that file is present, uh, basically class pass scanning in Spring Boot uses that file rather than scanning the class pass. And if you do this, uh, you move the 100 millisecond to 8 milliseconds, because you don't do class pass scanning at all. But on 6.5, going from 100 millisecond to 8 milliseconds is good, but not that good to be very, uh, very effective. Having said that, um, we still have like people so complaining. Yep, yeah, so we had 6.5 seconds of startup time, um, but we now know that only 100 milliseconds of that was uh, component uh, class pass scanning. So there's still 6.4 seconds that, um, where's that coming from? Not great. Funny story, we had someone on Twitter tweet, really something weird going on on my Mac, my Spring Boot app takes 13 seconds to start. I kind of what's in it? And he's like, nothing. I'm like, are you sure? He's like, yeah, nothing. So he said, I run iTunes. The app then starts in 1.2 seconds. Why does Spring Boot get fast when you run iTunes? Is it because iTunes is great? <laughs> is it because he stuck a start faster with iTunes annotation onto his code? 
Or is it because Mac OS Sierra can't resolve localhost in DNS and it waits for your DNS resolution timeout to run? <laughs> it turns out it's the, the latter. Um, if you're running on a Mac and you try anything to do with the network and it seems ridiculously slow, check your host file and check that you have an entry in there that tells it that localhost is 127.0.0.1. Because if it doesn't, it will go off to your DNS server and ask it to resolve localhost. And that will time out and then it will go, OK, well, I'll just start anyway. Um, so that took us longer than I'd care to remember to figure out what on earth was going on. So hopefully we've saved you some time there. So, so the key message here is if your application is slow to start, um, don't go with the what is this spring crap doing, but try to dig a bit more, not only in your application, but also in your environment. Because there might be things like, like those that we have on the, on the slide now. We're not saying it's never us slowing things down, but it's usually, there's usually a bit more to it. So if you have an app that's starting up slowly, um, if you can do some digging before you come to us, then that would be greatly appreciated and will probably help us focus on exactly what we need to do to, uh, to fix the problem if it is indeed in, in Spring Boot or the framework. Um, so there are some yeah, usual suspects. Network configuration we've kind of talked about already. Antivirus is a good one. Um, if you've got a bunch of files on disk and your antivirus scanner insists on scanning them every time anything tries to load them, that's going to really slow things down because you're then basically gating the performance of startup to how fast your antivirus software is. Um, lack of entropy. Um, Tomcat is unique among the three server containers that we support that it insists when you start it up, um, irrespective of whether or not using HTTP sessions, it tries to initialize a secure random instance. To do that, it needs, random, it needs entropy on the OS um, to be able to create the secure random. If that's not available, it will block startup until there's sufficient entropy available. Um, we've worked around that in Spring Boot 1.4, but if you're on an earlier version for some reason, um, you can configure the JVM to use urandom rather than random. Um, there are security implications in doing so, depending on who you listen to. Some people will tell you it's fine. Some people will tell you that you might as well just leave your front door open and welcome the hackers into your house. Um, I'm not a security expert, so I won't recommend one way or the other. Um, do your own reading, do your own research before you switch it on, um, I would say. Um, if you have code, yeah. If you simply have code in your constructor of your beans doing something, like initializing your library, anything, that's part of the startup too. Uh, so one, one case was um, we, we actually monitor the, um, the startup performance of the CLI, so the Spring command. We, we, we have tests that make sure that it's, it's really fast and fast enough. And turns out at some point between two releases, it improved by 500 milliseconds, which is really a lot. And it turns out someone, I'm not looking at you because it's me. So someone added in a constructor uh, the initialization of the HTTP client. So we added a goal to create a project from startospring.io from the command line. And in the constructor, I added HTTP components builder. I don't, I can't remember what the code was, but that thing was initializing the, the HTTP client, and that alone was taking 500 milliseconds. By simply moving that away from the constructor and create that easily, so the first time someone is actually invoking the command, was enough uh, to fix the problem. So you should also look to your own bean and what they're doing on startup because it it's really part of the startup time too. Um. JVM no verify flag. Um, so I talked a bit before about the verification that happens when a class loads. Um, and the verifier is kind of helpful and it's kind of a bit of a waste of space. If you switch it off and there's a problem with the bytecode that means that your application won't, the, the bytecode's invalid and verification will fail. The verifier isn't running, your JVM will abend, it will fall in a heap, um, it will crash basically. If you have the verifier running, your application will still crash. You'll just get an exception rather than the, the JVM process exiting abnormally. So at development time in particular, you might want to consider running with no verify on because it's surprising how long the verifier takes to verify the bytecode as it's loading. It doesn't really buy you anything. It, it doesn't stop your application from failing. It just changes how it's going to fail. So you might want to consider switching it off. And lastly, um, Stefan already mentioned, um, Dave Sire, did some great work. A um, bunch of JMH, JMH 
benchmarks um, for starting Spring Boot applications, comparing uh, you know, an executable jar, an exploded jar, you know, various different scenarios, different types of apps, you know, an empty one, a pet clinic one, because we have to test something when it's, you know, pet clinic's always a favorite. So if you want to look at that, it's kind of, a, it's a great resource, and it's fairly easy if you want to plug your own app into the benchmark framework. I think there's some instructions and things in the readme, so that can be a very useful tool as well um, if you want to profile the startup of your own app and get some, uh, get some numbers from it. That's it. I think we've just nope. about finished on time. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your time. Um, one last resource for you. Uh, this is the source code to everything that uh, Stefan walked through with you. Uh, everything's kind of one commit per step. So if you want to look at that and kind of go back through and, and, and step through in your own time or show your colleagues back at the office, you can do that and it kind of you can see things evolve. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.